just letting you know you should have gotten a notice now that you that the session is being recorded. So uh, welcome everybody. Uh, good morning. My name is Jessica Manfredi. My pronouns are she, her. I am with I am the PSLF program associate within the Washington State Office of the Student Loan Advocate. I also have here today my teammate. Her name is Hannah Deck. Uh, her pronouns are she, her. She will be assisting me today throughout the presentation, sharing links um, in the chat and at the end with the Q&A session that we will have. I just wanted to let you all know that we will be recording once again today's presentation. Uh, there is already a recorded version of this presentation on our website, uh, but there has some it has some old deadlines because some of the information has been updated by the Department of Education. So we are re-recording it so that we can make sure the information is updated on our website. Today's presentation is going to be about 40 to 50 minutes, um, and then we are going to have time for questions at the end. I do want to mention um, that depending on how many questions we get, we might not have time to get to all of your questions, but we will do our best. Um, to ask a question throughout the presentation, uh, please use the Q&A function, which should be available at the bottom of the page um, on your Zoom. The chat function was, will actually be disabled throughout the presentation, except that we, both me and Hannah as hosts, will be using it to share links during the presentation. Um, and we will actually also want to wait until the end of the presentation to answer questions, um, but you can use the Q&A function to ask questions throughout the presentation. We do ask that you stick to general questions on the Q&A. Please do not share any personable identifiable information, things like your social security number, phone numbers, emails, et cetera. Um, individual questions about your specific circumstances, if they're very specific, uh, should be submitted to us. I'll have Hannah put uh, the link to our student loan questions and complaints form uh, link in the chat right now, uh, so that if you have a very specific question about your situation, that would be uh, the appropriate place to ask it. Now that we got all of this spread away, um, I, you are all here, hopefully, because you want to learn more about public service loan forgiveness and the upcoming income driven account adjustment and how it may benefit you. A copy of these slides uh, transcript, as well as a recorded version of this presentation will be available on our website. I am going to ask Hannah to post the link to our website in the chat as well. You can use a copy of the slides to access all the links that uh, we're gonna be talking about today in the presentation. Now that we covered all these housekeeping items, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. If I can actually access the, the button to change the slides, there's just so many things here. Okay, give me one second. All right. Okay. All right, there we go. We're going. <laughs> We'd like to start with the snapshot of what student loan looks student loans that looks like in our state. So in the state of Washington, we have over 807 um, thousand federal student loan borrowers. Our outstanding student debt balance is $28.9 billion. And we put these numbers here not to intimidate anyone, but to really try to normalize student debt as much as possible. Because I think sometimes folks have a lot of shame and negative feelings or emotions that are brought up by this topic. And we want to really drive the point home that student debt is normal, that millions of people have it. So there's absolutely nothing to be ashamed about. Next, I want to share uh, with you a law that we have here in the state of Washington called the Student Loan Bill of Rights. It is a law that was passed in 2018 that created the Office of the Student Loan Advocate within the Washington Student Achievement Council, but it also did several other things like allowing our state to enforce state consumer protection laws against student loan servicers. Uh, servicers must now notify borrowers annually that our office exists and have information about how you can contact us on their website. And it also allowed borrowers like you to submit complaints or questions uh, to our office and get individual assistance and resources. And then, oh, the in this, sorry, I, I, I just thought that it was showing the, the incorrect slide. So in the past year, uh, there is also this new law called um, Senate Bill 5847. Uh, 
Uh, this is a bill that was create, that created my position and required our office to create certain materials to increase the awareness about public service loan forgiveness. Um, there are three specific uh, documents that are called out in the statute, a standardized letter for public employees, a detailed fact sheet, and a frequently asked question. These materials are actually already available on our website for you to use as resources. As a result of the bill, we're also uh, working with other state agencies to create a program to make uh, PSLF employment certification easier uh, for both borrowers and employers. And it will also require state agencies to provide notices in certain materials to all employers, all employees on an annual basis, such as when you're hired, uh, when you leave state employee, which will hopefully help increase awareness of the PSLF program and allow more state employees to benefit from PSLF. Moving on to talk about student loans. Um, if you don't know how to locate your federal student loan information, things like your balance, your servicer, et cetera, you will need to log in into uh, studentaid.gov. I'm gonna have Hannah post that link uh, in the chat for you. This website will help you view all your federal student loans, um, your student loan servicer information, and use all of the tools on their website. We will talk about some of those tools later in the presentation. To log in, you, you will need to go on the right corner of the page and it will ask you for your federal student aid ID, which is also known as FSA ID. This is your username and password uh, for this website. If you don't have one, you can click to create an account next to the login button. Once you log in, it will bring you to a dashboard that looks like this. This is the landing page uh, that will show you your total outstanding loan balance, your principal interest, and a lot of other information about your loans. If you want a comprehensive breakdown of all of your loans, you will want to click on the view details button next to my aid. And it will bring you to a page listing all aid you have received, including both grants and loans. The breakdown of your loans will include the type of loan that you have, the balances, and the interest rates for each individual loan. Now, on the right side of this page, you will be able to view your student loan servicer information under My Loan Servicer. If you click on the link under My Loan Servicer called View Servicer Details, you will be brought to a page with your servicer's website, phone number, and other contact information like mailing address. It is good to view your servicer details because you may actually have more than one servicer. So you may be asking yourself, who are these servicers? So servicers are basically a bunch of private companies that are contracted with the Department of Education to service your federal student debt. There were, these were the servicers that were in effect last year. Up until then, Fed Loan Servicing used to manage the PSLF program, but they decided not to renew their contract with the Department of Education in 2022. So all of those who are enrolled in PSLF at the time of the transfer should now be with a company called Mohila. Mohila is the new servicer managing the PSLF program. If you were previously with Fed Loan and you were enrolled in PSLF, your account should not, by now be transferred to Mohila. If not, please let us know. If you want to pursue PSLF, but Mohila is not your current servicer, that just means that you haven't yet completed a PSLF form. And we'll go over this process of applying and submitting your PSLF form in a little bit more detail in a future slide. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the normal public service loan forgiveness eligibility. And for any of you that have attended these webinars in the last year or even this year, this is going to look familiar, but there will also be some new information, so please stay tuned. So just to give you an overview of the PSLF program requirements, when you ask yourself, what do I need to be able to get forgiveness under PSLF? In a very straightforward way, there are four things that you need. You need the right type of employment, the right type of loan, the right type of repayment plan, and the right number of payments. So we're gonna go into a little bit detail on each of these uh, requirements. Okay, so the first thing that you want to look at is your employment. Employment for PSLF has to be full-time, which the Department of Education defines as 30 hours a week or more. This also means that you can have two or more part-time public service jobs that add up to 30 hours a week or more, as long as they are qualifying public employers. A public employer means any level of government, so that can be tribal, 
local, federal, state, et cetera, or a 501c3 nonprofit organization. This, uh, this, this includes basically any state agency, things like your local libraries, um, any public education, all of that. So if you are not sure, if you work for a nonprofit organization and you're not sure the tax filing status of your organization, you can, you can contact your human resources department to ask that question. The role and position you hold does not matter. It just matters if your employer is a qualifying public service employer. You also need to be employed when you apply and when you receive forgiveness. This means that you can't apply as soon as you make the right number of qualifying payments and leave your job for the private sector. You have to continue working in a qualifying public employer until you receive your official notice or letter of forgiveness. And then last, your employer can also be a 501c4 nonprofit organization, as long as it is providing one of the services that we have listed on this slide. It is important to note that labor unions or partisan political organizations are not eligible for PSLF. This does not mean that you cannot be represented by a union. You just need, you just cannot be directly employed by the union. For example, a lot of teachers and higher education employees are represented by a union. That's completely okay. So you have the right type of employment. The next thing you want to confirm is whether you have the right type of loans. If you don't know your loan types, remember, you can follow the instructions we gave earlier in the presentation to find out that information. The right type of loans for PSLF means having a direct loans, whether that is a subsidized or an unsubsidized loan. And it also includes grad plus loans and consolidated direct loans. All the other loans that are not in the green square, including Perkins loans and Fell loans, can only become eligible for PSLF if they are consolidated into a direct consolidation loan. Perkins and Fell loans are not direct loans, and they have both been discontinued at this time. Both Fell and Perkins loans are not eligible for PSLF unless, once again, they are consolidated into a direct consolidation loan. Pair plus loans are on their own category because even though they are considered direct loans, you need to consolidate them in order to gain access to an income-driven repayment plan, which is a requirement for PSLF that we're going to talk about next. Okay, so you have the right type of employment, the right type of loans. The next thing you want to do is make sure you're on the right type of repayment plan. An eligible repayment plan for PSLF is any of the income-driven repayment plans that are also known as IDR for short. You can see the complete list of these types of repayment plans on this slide. And also the 10-year standard repayment plan, which is the plan you usually get placed under automatically when you graduate if you don't do anything. You do not want to repay your loan only on the standard 10 year standard repayment plan because you will have paid off your entire balance before you become eligible for forgiveness. Some periods on it are okay as long as you also have some periods under an income driven repayment plan. Some repayment plans that are not eligible for PLEA SLF include the 30 year standard repayment plan available for consolidated loans, as well as any graduated and extended repayment plans. You can get help picking an eligible PSLF repayment plan using the loan simulator tool. The loan simulator will ask you to log in with your FSA ID, username, and password, and will pull, pull actual student loan data, your actual student loan data, like your balances, uh, interest rates, et cetera, and ask you questions about your household income, household size, tax filing status. And based on that information, it will calculate for you an estimated monthly payment under different repayment plans. So it's a really useful tool to help you choose the best repayment plan for you. So if you're not sure which repayment plans are eligible for PSLF, you can use this slide along with the uh, loan simulator tool to make sure that you pick a plan that is eligible for PSLF. Okay, so you have the right type of employment, the right type of loan, and the right type of repayment plan. The last piece you want to make sure is that you make 120 qualifying payments. All of these payments have to be made on time, in full, and on schedule. They also need to be made after October 1st, 2007, because that is when the PSLF program started. The payments do not need to be made consecutively or with the same student loan servicer, 
or while you work at the same employer. You can actually work at 10 different employers in 10 years, as long as they're all public serving employers that qualify for PSLF, that is okay. All right, so you've met all of these requirements, or maybe you've met all of these requirements, except that you have not made 120 qualifying payments yet. Uh, you will need to certify uh, your employer using what's called the PSLF help tool. This is basically the process to tell the Department of Education that you are working in the public sector, and here's proof that you do. Um, there's a form called the PSLF form, which combines three different forms to avoid confusion. The PSLF form is basically where you fill out where you work, the information about your employer, and then you have the, your employer sign to confirm that you do indeed work at that employer. Okay, and the PSLF help, help tool allows you to complete your PSLF form. Once the form is submitted and you're determined to be eligible, then your loans will be transferred to Mohila if they are not already servicing your loans. We recommend that you complete and submit your PSLF form using the PSLF help tool. It is recommended that you submit it every year to evaluate your eligibility and then just to get the number of up updated qualifying payments to keep track of the progress as you go. The PSLF help tool avoids most mistakes on the form as it auto populates a lot of the information for you. And the PSLF help tool also has a new DocuSign uh, feature that allows you and your employer to digitally sign the PSLF form. So you don't actually need to manually submit these forms anymore. And it automatically submits the form to Mohila for processing once all signatures are collected, which is very exciting. Okay, so record keeping is very important throughout the forgiveness process. While servicers really should be keeping detailed record, it is also a really good idea for you to do the same. You want to keep records of payments, copies of past PSLF forms and applications, and any physical or digital letters or notices you may receive from your servicer. All of them are useful to keep. If you call to speak to a representative, get their employer ID number. Every representative has one and note the date and time, but really the more communication you can do in writing, the better because it just generates a record. So uh, the PSLF waiver waiver ended on October 30th, um, October 31st of last year. Uh, this was a really awesome opportunity for borrowers who work in the public sector for a while, but haven't been able to access PSLF for different reasons. Um, it waived a lot of the requirements on the type of loans that the borrower had, the repayment plans on loans, um, payments before the consolidation also counted, uh, because usually under normal PSLF rules, once you consolidate your loans, any previous payments um, may be uh, reset to zero. Um, you could also receive forgiveness if you had retired from the public sector, and it was a really great opportunity. Um, and we're going to talk about a little bit about this new version of this opportunity that has taken over in a little bit. But before I do, I want to share with you some uplifting information. So this is the outcomes of the waiver. Um, how the outcomes of the waiver have looked like in our state. This is the data is all from the Department of Education website. So as you can see, in March of 2022, there were only about 3,000 uh, folks that had received forgiveness through PSLF in our state. And then as of late January, early February of this year, that number has more than tripled to 10,000 borrowers in our state that have now received forgiveness under PSLF, which translates to over $640 million of that that has been forgiven through the PSLF program for borrowers in our state. So I actually wanted to share this information with you, this data with you, to demonstrate that this is actually working. I understand that the process is confusing and really challenging to get all the paperwork together and deal with uh, student loan servicers, but it can really pay off and we're here to help you with the confusing parts. Now, to talk about the start of the show, the income-driven repayment one-time account adjustment, to make it clear, there is no actual PSLF waiver 2.0. We're just calling it that name because it has a lot of the same benefits that the PSLF waiver did, and people are already familiar with the term PSLF waiver. But if you go on the Department of Education website and you search for PSLF waiver 2.0, nothing is going to come up, okay? Um, we just want to make that clear so that there's no confusion. 
Before we can dive into um, IDR account, the IDR account adjustment, uh, we need to understand a little bit more about the ferment and forbearances. But before we do so, um, I want to make sure I point out that the forbearances we're going to be talking about today are the type that you contact your borrower to request, okay? It is not the same as the administered forbearance that is currently in place due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The administered forbearance um, was placed by the Department of Education. It's also known as the payment pause. It's being applied to direct or other Department of Education held loans due to COVID-19 emergency. It is important to highlight that it does not include commercially held Fell and Perkins loans that we spoke, we spoke about earlier. These periods under the payment pause will count as PSLF qualifying payments, even if you did not submit payments, as long as you were working full time in a qualifying PSLF public employer. If you made voluntary payments during the payment pause on an eligible loan, so a direct loan or another Department of Education held loan, you can request a refund of those payments by contacting your loan servicer. All right, so now that we got this out of the way, let's talk about general forbearances and deferments. Deferments and forbearances are ways for a student loan borrower to kind of raise their hand and to their servicer and request a request a pause on their student loan payments. Deferments and forbearances are very similar. For example, usually neither periods of deferment or forbearance count as qualifying payments under normal PSLF and IDR forgiveness rules. However, there are some key differences between the two. Deferment is a temporary stop to your loan payments for specific situations like being in school, unemployment, military service, or economic hardship. Deferments are a better option than forbearances because if you have subsidized loans, it does not accrue interest during deferment. But the downside is that it requires certification and paperwork for the specific reason you are applying. A forbearance also temporarily stops or reduces your student loan payments. The downside of a forbearance is that the interest is going to accrue whether your loans are subsidized or unsubsidized. The the benefit of a forbearance is that student loan servicers have a lot of discretion to grant the forbearance, and it usually does not require paperwork, so it's a lot easier to get than deferments. While deferments and forbearances are not necessarily bad, they're kind of like a toolkit that you have in your back pocket as a student uh, borrower that you can use to temporarily stop payments. A lot of people in the past have been steered into deferment, and especially into forbearances, when they could have qualified for an income-driven repayment plan to continue making progress toward forgiveness. And because of that, the Department of Education announced the IDR one-time adjustment last year, which is hoping to correct for borrowers who were steered into forbearance and deferment unnecessarily. This account adjustment allows for certain periods of forbearance and or deferment to convert into IDR payments for borrowers with 12 or more consecutive months of forbearance, 36 or more total um, 36 or more total months of forbearance, months spent in economic hardship or military deferments after 2013, in any period of deferment before 2013, except for in-school deferment. So it, periods of in-school deferment in default do not um, cannot count as IDR payments or towards PSLF, um, it, whether that was under the waiver, under the normal rules, or IDR account adjustments. So I just wanted to make sure that we pointed that out. However, it is important for us to highlight that borrowers with those commercial Fell and Perkins loans will need to consolidate by the end of 2023. This has been extended from the original May 1st, 2023 deadline. If you have federally held loans, like direct loans, the IDR account adjustment should automatically be applied to your account. Any time spent in repayment will also convert into IDR payments, including pre-consolidation payments, if applicable, and loans that qualify and hit the necessary number um, of payments, whether that is under PSLF or IDR forgiveness, will start to be forgiven as early as this spring. So these new IDR eligible payments will also be considered qualifying PSLF payments, 
But the borrower will need to certify employment if you haven't already done so for these new eligible payments to count. So basically, if you do get extra payments because of the IDR account adjustment, you are only gonna be able to, to, to make them into PSLF qualifying payments if you certify that during that period of those new payments uh, that were added to, account, to your account, you were actually working in a qualifying PSLF um, employer. This would lead for, to forgiveness for PSLF after the usual 120 qualifying payment instead of the 240 to 300 needed under IDR discharge. Now, something that is very exciting is that Parent PLUS loans can also take advantage of the IDR recount um, and receive PSLF credit for those periods that we talked about in the previous slide, okay? And this is really exciting because under the PSLF waiver, um, Parent PLUS loans were for the most part um, not eligible for those benefits. And many of the PSLF waiver rules will still apply, except that you must still be employed when you both apply and receive your forgiveness. So it's no, not available for those no longer employed in the public sector. And teacher loan forgiveness, if you received it, it can't overlap with PSLF. So under the waiver, um, you could have your five years of teacher loan forgiveness count towards the 10 years that you need for PSLF. But right now, if you apply, if you take advantage of the IDR account adjustment, you would need your five years of teacher loan forgiveness plus another 10 years of payments to be able to qualify under PSLF. And once again, Parent PLUS loans, which were excluded for the most part under the waiver, are now eligible to get many of those benefits through the IDR account adjustment. So how is the IDR adjustment similar to the PSLF waiver? And why are we calling it the PSLF waiver 2.0? Similar to the waiver, you can get credit for previous payments regardless of the loan type and repayment plan that you are under. You do not need to have number one, the, the, the right type of loans, or number two, the right type of repayment plan. You still need number three, which is the right type of employment, meaning you need to be employed in a PSLF qualifying employer in the public sector at the time that those qualifying payments will be applied to your account, right? So let's say that in 2008, you were working in the public sector and you were also making payments, but maybe at that time you weren't in the right repayment plan, right? Those periods will count because at that period of time you were, in, you were already employed in the public sector and you were making payments towards your, your, um, your loan. And finally, you still need number four, the right number of payments, meaning you still need to make 120 qualifying payments. However, payments here are in quotation marks, right? because the specific periods of forbearance and deferment illegible under the IDR account adjustment that I mentioned earlier will be considered qualifying payments, even though they weren't technically payments. It is also important to highlight that there may be some action needed on your in your part to qualify for this opportunity, which leads, which we're gonna talk about next, right? So you may be asking yourself, what do I need to do in order to take advantage of the IDR adjustment? Well, the answer to that question, as with most things, is that it depends on your specific circumstances. So we have created a few scenarios to kind of help you figure out uh, whether you need to do something or whether you just need to sit back and wait for the adjustment to be applied to your account. All right. So scenario number one is I have only direct loans. So you went into your FSA account and you realize that you only have those direct loans. And you have been paying all your loans for the same amount of time and you have certified and received approval on your PSLF form in the last 12 months. And for you to understand a little bit more what I mean by you have been paying all your loans for the same amount of time, right? So an example of this is you completed your undergraduate degree and then you went straight to work in the public sector or you completed your undergraduate degree and then you completed your graduate de degree right after your undergraduate degree. And then you started your job in the public sector, right? So you didn't really start making payments until the end of that graduate degree. So if you have been paying all your loans for the same amount of time, and you have certified your, your employment 
using the PSLF form for the last 12 months and you only have direct loans, you don't need to do anything. You just need to sit back and wait for the IDR adjustment to be automatically applied to your account by the end of 2024. All right, so scenario number two is you only have those direct loans, right? You went on your FSA account and you checked you only have direct loans. And you have been paying for all your loans for your same, the same amount of time, like on the previous slide. And you have not submitted, but you really have never submitted a PSLF form, or maybe it's been a really long time since you submitted a PSLF form. The action that's going to be needed on your part is that you will need to submit PSLF forms for all qualifying public sector employers you have not yet certified. So your qualifying payment counts are updated to reflect any of the new IDR eligible payments that you may receive because of the adjustment, okay? Scenario number three is I have parent plus loans and or non-direct loans, those Fell, Perkins, or Hugh loans that we talked about earlier. So if you are in this situation, there may be some action needed on your part. You want to consider applying for a direct consolidation loan by December 31st, 2023, to get the full benefits of the IDR account adjustment, okay? And then if you're applying for PSLF, you also want to make sure that you submit PSLF forms for all qualifying public sector employers you have not yet certified, so your qualifying payment counts are updated to reflect any new eligible IDR payments that you're gonna get because of the recount, okay? So if you are in this situation, you're most likely going to have to um, um, consolidate in order to get all of the benefits that you can get from the IDR adjustment. Scenario number three is, I have been paying for some of your loans for a longer period of time than others. So what do we mean by that, right? Like that can be a little bit confusing to understand. So an example for this, for someone that's trying to get PSLF is you went to undergraduate school, you had a break, and in during that break between your undergraduate and your graduate school, you were working in a job in the public sector. But then while you were doing your job, you're like, you know what, I think I wanna go back to um, graduate school to get my master's degree or a certification or something of that nature. You went to your graduate school and then after that you graduated and you were still working in the job uh, in a job in the public sector, right? So basically your undergraduate loans may have a higher PSLF payment count, right? Than your graduate loans because they're older loans and you did work in between that time in the public sector, right? If this is your circumstance, you want to consider applying for a direct consolidation loan by December 31st, 2023, to get the full benefits of the IDR recount and to place all your loans in the same timeline for forgiveness. So in this case, someone in this situation, if their undergraduate loans had 80 qualifying PSLF payments and their graduate loans had 40 qualifying PSLF payments, if you consolidate before the end of the year, okay, you will have your new consolidated loan have the same number of qualifying payments as your undergraduate loan that had the 80 qualifying payments for PSLF, okay? Um, you also want to make sure that you submit PSLF forms for all qualifying public sector employers that you have not yet certified, so your qualifying payment counts are updated to reflect any new IDR eligible payments. And as you can see, this is kind of a trend between all of this, right? You always want to make sure that your um, PSLF uh, forms are up to date for all qualifying public sector employers you have had. All right. So this is a small overview of the direct consolidation process in six steps. Remember, consolidation is not needed for everyone, right? Um, you want to consider uh, applying for uh, a consolidation if you have Fell or Perkins loans, Pair Plus loans, or if you have been paying some of your loans for a longer period of time than others. If you're not in this group of people, you, mo you don't have to submit a consolidation unless for some reason you have another reason to do it, you know? Uh, step one, the first step is to make sure that 
on the application, you select all the loans that you want to consolidate, and you should use choose Mohila as your servicer if you're working towards PSLF. The second step is to choose your repayment plan. A tool called the Repayment Estimator will appear um, in the online consolidation application to help you decide which plan is best for you. You will need to sign up for an IDR plan in order to be eligible for PSLF. So make sure that one of the IDR options, the income-driven repayment plans, are affordable to you. The step number three is, if you're comfortable, uh, you can use the IRS data retrieval tool to import taxable income from the IRS. This allows you to hopefully not have to submit extra paperwork to your servicer to sign up for an IDR plan. But if you did not file taxes um, or your income has decreased significantly since the last la you, since you last filed your taxes, you will not you need to send you will need to send at least one pay stub from the last 90 days to Mohila in order to enroll in, in income driven repayment plan. After you apply for IDR you will review and accept the terms and conditions for the consolidation. You will then be required to list three references that do not live with you or together with each other. Finally, you will review and sign the master promissory note for the new loan. A few things to note is that once the loan is consolidated, you will receive a confirmation from the Department of Education via email or mail. This will include a deadline for canceling the loan consolidation if you decide not to go through with the consolidation. If you're not sure you want to consolidate, know that you can go into the consolidation application, play around with the consolidation calculator and repayment options before you officially decide to consolidate your loans. Once you exit the application, as long as you did not sign and reveal the master promissory note, you are not going to be bound to anything. We also recommend that you use the steps to apply for PSLF document that we have put together prior to consolidation for a little bit more guidance before making that decision. So there's a lot of things happening in the student loan world right now. So here's a recap of some of the most important events. There have been a couple of major service transfers in the last year. All loans from Fed Loan Servicing have now been transferred, should now have been transferred to Mohila at this time. Mohila is now the new PSLF program servicer. All loans from Navient should have been transferred at this time to Aid Vantage. All loans from Great Lakes are starting to be transferred to Nelnet. The transfer is not completed yet. So if you are with Great Lakes, you're gonna see that happening uh, sometime this year. The payment pause currently in place will end sometime in 2023. The Department of Education currently states payments will resume either 60 days after the debt relief litigation is resolved or 60 days after June 30th if the litigation is not resolved by that point. You are going to receive notifications from federal student aid regarding the return to repayment once a final date is established. So make sure that you keep an eye on your email because that information is going to be coming to you once it's available. The one-time debt relief, also known as the Biden debt relief cancellation, Supreme Court case, was heard in February, but it's still pending a decision. We don't have any intel on what that's going to, what the outcome of that's going to be, and we're waiting anxiously for a decision like most borrowers. Um, there is, of course, the IDR adjustment that is happening between now and sometime in 2024. This was extended from the previous July 2023 target date. Remember, you may still need to take action before the end of 2023 to maximize your benefits under this opportunity. There is the Fresh Start program, which moves folks out of default and makes them eligible for financial aid that is currently in effect to 2023. So if you know anyone that's in default, um, and especially anyone in default that's looking to go back to school, this is a great opportunity. So let them know about it. Uh, several student loan debt regulations will go in effect on July 1st, including some new PSLF rules that will hopefully make the program a little bit easier. And finally, there is a new 5% income-driven repayment plan being discussed right now that the Department of Education is hoping to implement by the end of 2023. We think this is a little ambitious um, with everything going on, but we'll keep in on the lookout, which reminds me that if you want to stay updated on all student loan related things from now until the end of the year, we're hoping to continue bringing Washington State and 
borrowers uh, webinars discussing all the new changes to PSLF and student loan debt happening in 2023. Keep an eye on both of our websites, the Student Loan Advocacy webpage and the PSLF webpage for updates in upcoming webinars related to student loan debt. We also want to highlight a few resources to you. First, our steps to apply for PSLF document, which has step-by-step -step instructions on how to apply for PSLF. This is a great document, especially for those who are just starting from scratch when it comes to PSLF and want to make sure they don't miss anything. Second, something that we highlighted earlier is the PSLF help tool to help you generate and digitally sign your PSLF form. Please use the tool to do this process because it's gonna help you avoid a lot of the headaches and you also will now have to submit manually your form to Mohila, which is a big, big, big deal. So use the PSLF help tool to complete your PSLF form. If you apply for PSLF, um, for example, maybe you have applied for PSLF before the October 31st, uh, 2022 deadline for the waiver. You can check the status of your application on the Mohila website. Um, if you applied um, and, and did all the work before October 31st, 2022, and you go into this website, enter your information and nothing pulls up, please let us know because there might have been something that went wrong with your uh, submission. And we definitely wanna make sure that we, um, that we talked to Mohila to figure out what ha happened to your submission, okay? So um, if you applied after January 1st and it's still not showing up your information there, it's possible that the information has not been uploaded to the system yet. And I would wait a little bit, a couple of months to see if that information uh, pulls up um, in, in case it hasn't already done so. Last but not least, we want to point out to our frequently asked questions document that we kindly put together for you as well as other helpful links and resources that are all available on our website. So we really recommend that you check all of these awesome resources out. Finally, um, it would be great if you could complete a short survey to let us know how we're doing. Your opinion really matters um, to us and helps us understand the needs of Washington student borrowers and continually developing presentations like this for you. I'll have Kana uh, go ahead and post the link to the survey on the chat. Um, I know that some people sometimes get our survey confused with the other links that we sent. If it's a Google link, it's taking you to our survey, okay? So just letting you know, um, that's what you're going to be completing. And I really, really appreciate if you take the time to complete that um, and help us help us know what we're doing. And then now you're probably wondering, I still have so many questions. This stuff is very confusing, which we totally get, right? Um, well, if you have a very specific question about your case, um, you may consider submitting a question or complaint um, to us in our student complaint portal called studentcomplaints.wa.gov. I once again have Hannah post that link for you on the website. I mean, not on the website, on the chat. Um, make sure that if you do submit a question through there, that you select the student loan questions and complaint form. Thank you for the opportunity to present to you today. And now we can take a few questions. And I think that we haven't had a lot. So hopefully we'll be able to go through all of your questions today. All right. So um, someone asked, what if I don't qualify for an IDR plan? So Heather, that's a good question. So first of all, there is an IDR plan that every single person can qualify for. It's called the Income Contingent Repayment Plan, ICR for short, right? So that repayment plan, anybody can qualify for, even if they're making millions, okay? Now, the problem with that repayment plan is that it's the least generous of all the repayment plans, okay? And because of that, it requires 20% of your discretionary income, okay? Now, whether it makes sense for you to sign up for an income contingent repayment plan to eventually get forgiveness under public service loan forgiveness, that is going to be a personal decision, right? Because for some people, the income contingent repayment plan, if that's the only plan that they qualify for, does not make sense because the payment might be higher than what they would be paying on the 10-year standard plan, right? And then in that case, PSLF might not be for you, 
Okay, but if you're not sure, you can always just submit a question to us and we can look at your case a little bit more. But just know that no matter what your income is, there's at least one income contingent, one plan that you can qualify for, and that would be the income contingent repayment plan. All right. Um, if you request a refund for voluntary payments made during COVID, will this affect payment amounts or will they remain the same on an income driven repayment plan? So Jules, I am, I'm a little confused um, with this question, just because if you were to request uh, um, a voluntary, uh, you, uh, I mean, a refund for the voluntary payments that you've made since March 13, 2020, when the payment pause started, that is not going to affect your eligibility for an income driven repayment plan. It is also not going to affect your eligibility to get that period of time to count towards a public service loan forgiveness uh, qualifying payment. So hopefully that answers your question. If not, just let us know, right? Um, and then Steve said, can you consolidate if you only have one loan? Um, Steve, I would be... I would be curious why you think you might need to consolidate if you have only one loan, unless you have only a Fell or a Perkins loan, right? If you have only one Fell or only one Perkins loan, you should still be able to consolidate that into a direct consolidation. But if you already have, a, if it's already a direct loan, I don't see the reason why you would only want to consolidate a single loan. You have a parent plus loan. Okay, yeah, so you should be able to consolidate that, I believe. Um, I have to double check, actually. That's a, a very unique question. Um, so, Steve, can you submit a question to us in our complaint portal so that I can follow up with you? Because I'm actually not 100% sure if you have just one parent plus loan, if you can consolidate, I believe you should be able to, but I want to confirm that for you. So please submit um, a question in our complaint form for us. Um, you have so many links that cannot be clicked on. Can you put them in the chat, please? So Gina, the easiest way for you to access all of the links is actually to go to our website. I'm gonna go ahead and have Hannah share the link to our website once again in the chat. And um, in that website, there it, you can download a copy of the slides. And then once you have the slides in your hand, you can click on all the links all of the links, right? That probably will make it easier um, for you to click on everything that we have showed. So just go into our website, download the, the, the slides, and then you should have access to all of the links. And also our website also has all those links listed there. Um, all right, so I know that we had a very small group today. Uh, we only have about 20 people here. So if I, I wanna give you all a little bit more time if you wanna ask any more questions, um, I'm happy to take them, but otherwise, I think we may be done. Going once? <laughs> Going twice? Oh, thanks, Jules. <laughs> um, so um, I, I, it looks like nobody else has a question. Um, so thank you so much for coming to our webinar. Um, if you have, if you have a follow up. Um, question, right, um, that you want to ask in more detail about your cir circumstances, please go to studentcomplaints.wa.gov, okay? And uh, you can ask a more uh, detailed question there. Uh, we are available to help you um, through that form. So uh, it seems like we had some, um, some information that is um, some extra questions here. Can you share any details about the 5% repayment plan that was mentioned? Um, so Nicholas, not really, because it's not really set in stone yet, right? It's still very much in the early stages of discussion. And we're not even sure at this point if it's going to be implemented, right? So um, I would just say, keep an eye out on our website because if there is any information that is released, we'll make sure that we update our website with that information, okay? Um, I am on, I am on ongoing fixed loan. Will I ever have a chance to switch to IDR? Yes, Krista, you can actually apply to switch to an income driven repayment plan today. If you want, um, you can switch your repayment plan at any point in time. 
right? Um, so there's your answer. You can, if you want to, you can switch to switch to an income driven repayment today. <laughs> um, last question, where is the recording going to be available in our website? So it's going to be available on our website. And I did notice that someone asked about um, our contact information. Here's the thing, right? Uh, we want people to reach out to us primarily using our form. Why? Because the form helps us gather information that we need from you in order to be able to help you, right? There are questions that we're going to have to ask you no matter how you contact us. So if you could save both of us time by completing the form, that's the easiest way to get a hold of us. Okay. And then at that point, depending on your question, if it's a little bit more complicated of a question, we might be able to schedule some time um, to speak. But we still ask that the easiest way to get a hold of us, if you have a question, a specific question, would be to submit um, a question to our complaint form. Okay. All right. Um, seems like now maybe we might be done um, with questions. Once again, thank you so much for attending today. Um, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And then once again, if you need help, submit a question to us using our complaint form. I hope you have a good rest of your day. Bye-bye.